Hi everyone, this is Isaac Steinkamp, General Manager of the Pittsburgh Pond Garbers and Ready for Chess Summit, the official sponsor of the Pittsburgh Pro Chess League team. And I'm here today reporting from Vienna, Austria on our match against the Portland Rain in week six. I'm, I'm sorry again, once again for getting out of this video a little bit late. I had to finish up my tournament in Lienz, Austria, the Dillamitten Bank Open, but now that I'm finished, I have, you know, I finally have a moment from my hotel room here in Vienna to report on what was another close match for the Pittsburgh Pond Grabbers, but again, uh, in our favor, eight and a half to seven and a half, the closest possible margin. And the Pittsburgh Pond Grabbers finish uh, the first six weeks of the season, uh, two and four, and it's earned us a rematch with the Minnesota Blizzard. Uh, a team that we lost to in week two, nine to seven, but a team that we're very eager to get our revenge against. So I really think that, you know, our team has, you know, shown a lot of strength, um, not only to be able to win as the favorites after starting 0 and 4, but to be able to have a lot of perseverance, especially when the margin is really close. So, you know, in this match, I actually wasn't able to watch it live, so I can't talk so much as I, you know, as I have with the other videos about like live moments of the match. But, you know, after looking over some of the games from this match, it, became very clear to me that like this Portland team was not a very easy team to beat and we did a very good job putting them away just like we did with the Legos um, but this time with a much stronger um, uh, much stronger lineup uh, featuring Alexander Shabalov, David Hua and a few of our other strongest players so you know we had a lot of really good turnout and you know what can I say I, I think our team is very happy to be at where we're at at two and four and even though next week is likely to be the last week for the Pittsburgh Pond Grabbers in the inaugural season of the Pro Chess League. I think that we can dub this season a success regardless of how next week goes. And I think a 3-4 and four result would be a pretty phenomenal way to finish, especially if you consider that we started 0-4. So that being said, I think we had two potential games of the match for us. Um, but as I was looking over one of them, I really felt like one of them was the ultimate game of the season for us in terms of just domination, complication, uh, and just overall being able to get that critical win. And it comes from David Hua on our board two, playing against um, Chumachenko and FM uh, representing Portland. And he has the white pieces here. And we, as we can see, we already have a really complex position. Um, the white king seems like it's tucked away on the queen side, away from black's queen and away from the g4 bishop. But alas, we see the black rook is on c8 and the c file could potentially open, thus causing some trouble and disruption on white's queen side. Meanwhile, white has his own ideas of attack, putting all of his pieces pointing towards the king side. The rook has just moved to f1 with the idea of putting pressure on the f file. And we're about to see the game blow open, especially here when black played the move f5, allowing bishop to g5, queen to h5. And David here decided to go for the exchange sack, allowing the game to get interesting. So h2, 4, queen, h1, knight, h3. And here we see that even though um, white has given up the exchange, um, there's a lot of interesting compensation here because black's pieces aren't you know, fully coordinated. The queen on h2 is a little bit awkward. It's not easy to quite see how it's going to get out. And at the same time, we're about to see black's king be completely opened up for a move like g takes f5, after which c4 was played, bishop to b1. Um, this bishop looks like it could be really passive right now, but by putting it on b1, we keep potential op options open of opening up on the light squares. Uh, I ran this through Stockfish really quickly, and if you put it in the chess.com engine, you'll notice that the uh, evaluation is constantly changing. Uh, originally, it'll tell you that black is winning, and then it'll say that it's equal, and then white is winning. Uh, but I think that white's position is per choice here. So after black played knight to d7, bishop to f4, white decided it was time to trade off some pieces and simplify the position. And here g5 was a very committal move, potentially giving white an already winning position. Um, because as we can see, these three pawns here, d5, e4, and f5, these are all long-term pass pawns. And this will give white a huge advantage later in the game. So here, white could have played the move knight to e6. After which, knight takes e6, d takes e6. We can see these pawns start to roll, so d takes e6 and f6. Uh, the rook on f1 is perfectly placed, and the queen has a hard time getting back into the game. But here, David decided to play knight h3, which is also fine. Queen to e5 was played, rook to d1, putting pressure on the knight. g4, knight f2. And here Chumachenko realized that this knight really can't do too much, so he decides to go ahead and sacrifice it by playing knight to b3 check. So after ab3, uh, knight to c5, with the idea of trying to use these light squares to his advantage. Um, Black is obviously worse in this position, but it's still a fairly complicated game. Queen to g5, king to h8, rook h1. White is slowly bringing all these pieces over. If white can even push these pawns, maybe this bishop on b1 can get into the game. Knight takes b3, king to d1. Rook to g8, queen h6. So obviously we have ideas of threatening mate. Rook c7, bishop to c2, queen d4 check. And after king to e2, we quickly realize that 
in actuality, black has no way of really being able to attack white's king. This is one of the nice things about this game, was that white's placement of his pieces was really well thought through. This queen on h6 defends d2, e3, and any important squares on the dark squares here, and this work on h1 helps cover the back rank. So while white's pieces are also attacking, they're also doing a very critical job of defending. Black played g3, knight h3, and here black actually made what I would consider to be the losing move if, if it's not already happened. Queen to g7, because here, as I mentioned earlier, these three pawns become really strong uh, pawns after the queens come off. Queen g7, rook g7, bishop to b3, and now that, we'll, now that we see the ma er, remaining material on the board, we have rook versus rook and two knights versus rook, but these three pass pawns are going to dictate the end of the game. d6, rook c6, rook d8, and here it was a simple way to convert. The rooks came off the board, and of course white will never lose this. This was a nice little touch here, knight to d6, and we have a queen and the game shortly followed uh, an end to it after a checkmate in three moves. h5, queen e6, and we saw knight of seven checkmate. So this was a really nice played game, nicely played game by White, um, in a position that seemed fairly complicated. It, it almost looked as if White was dominating the whole game. Even the computer had a little bit of a fist, uh, like a fuss with it. But I think nonetheless, this was kind of that hashtag nerves of steel game that we've been talking about all season that we've been wanting to see. And it came at the most important match of our season against Portland, a uh, game that helped us get that critical point to win by the narrowest of margins, eight and a half to seven and a half. As I mentioned before, we have a rematch with the Minnesota Blizzard, uh, Battle on the Ice Part 2, uh, in which I think that it promises to be a, um, a fairly competitive matchup. Uh, we lost 9-7 to in the second week of the season. That was a game that we thought that we had a really good shot at winning, uh, and it was just a couple games that went in the wrong direction. But, you know, I think our team is a lot stronger than they were uh, back in Week 2. And if we can bring our A game... You know, in this round, we can manage our time a lot better like we have been all se uh, all these last two uh, weeks uh, compared to this we did in week two. And then I would say that we have a really good shot at winning this game. I, you know, I think Minnesota also has a pretty strong lineup. They, you know, they have a lot of strong players like Mauricio uh, Flores and John Bartholomew and Andrew Tang. So this should be a fairly exciting close to the season for both of us. I am not sure whether or not Minnesota is playing for a playoff, uh, playoff spot. But nonetheless, even if they are, we are hoping to deny them. Uh, sorry, guys. And I think that uh, you guys will enjoy it. Again, I won't be able to watch um, this week's uh, matchup, unfortunately, being in Vienna at a six-hour time difference. I will be sound asleep when the match starts. So if you guys want to help us out, help us show your hashtag Nerves of Steel pride, that black and gold pride, you know, tweet at us during the match. Uh, we'll be happy to retweet or whatever your impressions of how you guys think we're doing, uh, especially if it's close or if we're pulling away. You know, we want to hear what you guys think about this last week of the season. Maybe um, hear are some things about what you guys like to see next season as the Pro Chess League continues to grow. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, I think we're all looking forward to a strong finish to the season. Three straight wins would be the magic number. All right, well, this is Isaac Steinkamp signing off for the Pittsburgh Pro Chess League team.